People love him already. He's got the uh, Rhode Island twang. The long pass to Moore and a pin block from Martin. Tune in to Cam's corner. <laughs> He's going to make it here. Draws the foul for another Rhode Island in one. I can't his own podcast. It's good off the backboard and in. Trying to break. And we are back, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Cam's Corner, Season 3, Episode 23, Episode 91 overall, still on that road to 100. But today joining me, a Syracuse alum, 2019 Jim Nance Award winner, awarded to the best collegiate sports broadcaster in the nation, and currently the play-by-play voice for the Celtics on the road, filling in for the legendary Mike Gorman once this season concludes uh, after Mike's retirement, Drew Carter. Drew, what an honor it is. To have you on Cam's Corner, I appreciate you uh, hopping on during your busy schedule. How you been? What's up, Cam? 100%, man. Thanks for having me. Um, although, I mean, you're friends with Joe Missoula, so it's not an honor <laughs> to talk to me. Like, you got you got friends in high places, man. You don't need to be saying that to me. But uh, it's great to be here, despite the, the Jalen Brunson jersey behind you. I love Jalen Brunson, but I can't co-sign a Knicks jersey. Yeah, that's, that's the way I mix emotions. You talk about Joe, I mean... It, it, it was tough when I obviously when he got the news and he was the head coach of the Celtics, I'm like, that's amazing news. But it's like now I'm drawn because I'm like a diehard Knicks fan. Me and my dad are like diehard yeah. Knicks fans. And it's like you got to root for the Celtics. You got to root for Joe and, you know, the hometown kid from Johnson from where I'm from. So um, that was actually the first question I wanted to ask you. You know, thinking about questions to conduct this interview. It's like, you know, what do you ask somebody like Drew Carr, who's done everything, who's had at such a young age? You know what I mean? So it's very inspiring for me to look at um, looking back at all your recent work. But. Um, I told you about Dan Missoula, his dad, uh, before we hopped on the pod, um, how much of an influential part in my life he played um, and how much Joe resembles him. So I wanted to ask you firsthand when you first got on the job, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll backtrack and, and talk about your entire journey, but your first initial thoughts of Joe. Well, the first time I met Joe was, first of all, thanks for saying the, the kind words. That's not really nice of you. I appreciate it. Uh, but the first time I met him was before a preseason game. I think it was our opener. Um, we might have been playing the Knicks, actually. So I know Cam was at home watching that game with his pom-poms out, orange and blue, for New York <laughs> to win. Even though it was just preseason, he was stoked. Um, and Scal, and like, of course, you know, calling games for a team on the local show, like, the relationship with a coach is pretty important. Um, and and I didn't know what to expect, really, because, you know, of course, I'm a huge NBA fan, so I followed the Celtics, and I knew the whole situation with Joe taking over. And uh, it seemed like it was, you know, obviously rushed right before the season, and then they were great at the start. And then I thought Joe got a lot of, you know, unwarranted hate uh, throughout the season because people just didn't know who he was, and he came from the back bench of the coaching staff. So I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I did know that he he's pretty, you know, guarded with the media. Um, and I think it makes sense because, and he's talked about this, where if you go from, you know, being from the second row of the coaching staff where nobody knows who you are, you know, you could probably like walk into a grocery store in Boston and, you know, Celtics diehard might recognize you and stop you and want to talk. But for the most part, nobody cares what you say. Um, and then you go to the head coach of the Boston effing Celtics, like, holy smokes. And so I don't really blame him for kind of, you know, putting his his walls up in that first year. But, you know, I had seen some stuff he had said about maybe opening up a little bit more this year. So, again, I didn't really know what to expect. But before the first preseason game, so you know, for those who don't know, coaches do a pregame press conference every game, even in the preseason. And so Brian Scalabrini, who's my partner on Celtics games, was like, let's go meet Joe. So we kind of hung out, listened to his press conference. and. Afterwards, Scal walked up to him and introduced me. And I guess that was in early October. Um, and my first impression was like, this guy seems pretty intense. You know, obviously that was an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half before a game, again, even in the preseason. But, you know, he was pretty locked in. And uh, I would say that impression hasn't changed. I think Joe Mazzullo is a pretty intense guy. And the more I've gotten to know him, I feel like, the more I sort of understand how he approaches life, um, and I feel like it's not like we're best friends or anything. We haven't even yeah. known each other for a year, but I feel like I'm starting to understand that um, Joe Mazzula is a fiery guy, a competitive guy, and at times a combative guy. And I think that's how he's gotten to where he is at such a young age. Perfect timing, right? I mean, he just tried to contest, uh, who was it, Royce O'Neal? 
from Phoenix. He jumped oh, out. So hey, look, man, <laughs> can't can't let him feel good about himself going back to the huddle. Isn't it funny, Cam, how that became like the biggest story from the game? Scal talks about this all the time, and it's like it's not like that's something the Suns did on purpose. But anytime you blow somebody out, it's like if there's anything else that happens in the game, that's going to be the main talking point. So that's why you see, like, we challenged a call against Toronto. This was in November in the in-season tournament. We challenged a call up, like, 30 points. And so, of course, Dennis Schroeder and all the Raptors are like, that's so disrespectful. I'm so pissed. I'm so angry. Ask me about that in the post game. So no one had to talk about the fact that they got their asses handed to them. Hmm. So, like, the, the Celtics kill the Suns. What are they talking about on Inside the NBA? Oh, Joe Mazzulla, why is he contesting that shot? Like, come on. It's not that big of a deal. It's an attention grabber, like – Something like as little as that goes viral on every single yeah. account. Like, I mean, I've seen, I follow like NBC uh, Sports Boston and I see like the post game stuff from Joe and things like that. Unless he says something like outlandish or if like something like that happens, it's like on blast. And which I get, that's yeah. that's why they, they do it. It's for the views and things like that. But um, like I said from the start, like that's like the way he speaks is like, I just see his dad, like, and I can yeah. hear his dad. Um you know, Dan was somebody that, um, like, you feared in a way, but you respected it just because of the way, like, he held himself and the way that, you know, he, like, he would enter a room and it's like everyone stands up tall, everyone's, you know, making sure they're on their best behavior. Um, yeah. Practice was, you know, definitely eye-opening like that. But I, w- I always wanted to see, like, what it was like um, from, like, Joe's perspective when he first started. And I talked with his former high school coach, uh, Jamal Gomes, at Bishop Hendrigan in Rhode yeah. Island. And he was at his first – ever practice he calls him up he's like coach you want to come to my first practice and jamal's like taken away by it and um you know it was it was nothing like he ever saw before because he never saw joe in that coaching state of mind mind you he already coached at like colleges and stuff but it's like yeah you know what i mean jason tatum jalen brown they're all like right there and he's like this this kid from johnson rhode island is is the orchid like leading all of this you know what i mean it's insane dude you know what, Cam? I heard that same story yesterday, actually, for the first time about Jamal going to the Celtics' first practice. Mm-hmm. I think the cool thing about Joe, and you tell me if if Dan was like this as well, but the cool thing about Joe is I feel like he is an old-school throwback in, in terms of how intense he is and maybe how he motivates the guys, which, again, we don't really see because, um, like, the intense parts of practice and, and maybe shoot-around, if there are, we don't really see that. Um, but to me, he strikes me as that type of guy. But he's also new school in terms of, you know, statistics, right? We've talked about Missoula ball. Like, we take a ton of threes, most in the NBA for the second year in a row, which, like, it's not analytics to say three is more than two, but you tend to see teams that are more forward-thinking shoot more threes because it's a more efficient shot. And Joe talks about that all the time. It's not that they want to chuck threes all the time. It's just that it's the fact that sometimes, and most of the time, actually, the three is a more efficient shot than the two. And then if you listen to him really talk the game, I mean, J.J. Redick said it on a broadcast, but the guy's a basketball sicko. I feel like he exists in both worlds. Like he's a relic in terms of how he motivates guys. He's like a hard ass, but he also loves the numbers and and loves like dialing up plays that people haven't seen before. I think he's a he's a fascinating dude and a fascinating coach. Uh, But what I heard about that that first practice is that at a certain point, Joe kept asking Jamal, like, what do you think? Like, it's my first practice. Mm -hmm. Like, how am I doing? And Jamal's like, I don't even know the language you guys are speaking (laughs) like this. I haven't heard a lot of the stuff you guys are saying um, because it is it is pretty new school. And I feel like in basketball, there's an easy there's a tendency to think like, hey, it's five on five. It's a lot of one on one. Like, just get your best player the ball and get out of the way. Not the case. Like if you if you talk hoops with guys like Joe Missoula, you understand how complicated it is. Yeah, like you said, it's like a whole nother world when you talk to somebody like him. Um, yeah. And hearing that story for the first time from Jamal was when I was conduct- uh, conducting that documentary on his dad. And um, I heard that for the first time. And I'm like, this has to be incorporated in this somehow. This isn't I've never I've never heard of this. He's probably told this story before, because I think that was like some kind of feature on something. When, once Joe like got the head coaching gig and um, I know they showed Dan on TV before, like a picture of him. So I know he's always talking about him. And um, it's pretty cool. Like it, It's a full circle kind of thing but um that's cool that your, your first experience with him was was like that and you know it hasn't changed um that's somebody like yeah like like his dad never changed was always the same kind of guy always level-headed and uh you always respected him but 100 um, 100 i really like the guy i love his wife kame kame is yeah. super she's delightful it's it's kind of funny because you rarely see joe Missoula smile at least in front of a camera 
Uh, but then Kame is like totally the opposite. So I think that's probably why that works. Uh, mm -hmm. But Joe, I mean, I do the the one on one interview with him before the road games. And I'll just be honest, like sometimes it's challenging because uh, we don't have we don't have that much time. Uh, like probably have two minutes for that segment because we got to get to the actual game and we have a lot of commercials to play before. Um, and sometimes it's tough because, you know, he wants to talk about the game and really nothing else. And to me, sometimes that's frustrating because like we've talked about, I think he's an interesting dude. And and there are things that we talk about off camera that I, I love to ask him about on camera to give the fans more of a, a full picture of Joe Missoula as a guy beyond what we just see in, in the games and in the press conferences. But he likes to keep that to himself, which I respect. Um, and, and we have conversations basically before every interview we do about like, hey, what do you want to talk about? What do you not want to talk about? Like, for example, uh, the last one we did was Selection Sunday. Um, and I we've talked about a little bit about, you know, the college basketball he watches and doesn't watch. And of course, he played at West Virginia and it's from Rhode Island. So I kind of wanted to ask him about Selection Sunday. And he was like, Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the game. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> he wants to he wants to keep the main thing the main thing. But the problem is when you don't have a lot of time, it's not like you're gonna really really get anywhere in that. Like we're not gonna diagram how to defend the Wizards pick and roll in two mm -hmm. minutes, right? So sometimes that's tough. But I feel like we're getting there. And the great thing, Cam, is I I hope that Joe and I are both with the Celtics for decades. Truly. Yeah, that'd be really cool to see. And uh, like I told you, April 11th, I mean, of course, sad to see that I'm a Knicks fan, but I will be at that game. I really want to <laughs> see you guys in but person. We're playing the Knicks that day. No, I can't I talk. To you. I know. I can't talk to you, April. See, that, this is the thing. I'll, I'll end off on this with the, the Joe note, and then we'll get into everything. But um, I, I've said this on a few podcasts. Me and my dad, diehard Knicks fans, right? Um, every game that we go to that's away, that's not in MSG, we – He's like, you got to wear all black. You can't wear a Knicks jersey. You can't wear a Knicks hoodie. Just wear all black. And I'm like, why? Like, you got to enjoy it. Like, you can enjoy the game. Just don't wear any Knicks stuff. You don't want to get heckled, you know, especially in Boston. That's like the worst place to wear any Knicks things. And yeah. um, the overtime game, uh, was it like a year? I think it was last year. It was the overtime game and the Knicks ended up winning. But like, that was like probably like the best sports environment I've ever been in. Like the yeah. loudest environment I've ever been in. Um. And like, there's three Knicks fans behind me, so I'm like, I'm giving them high fives. I don't care. Like, I yeah. gotta in, embrace it. But um, I like that. Where are proudly? Yeah, I'm gonna re I'm gonna be torn that day for sure. Um, come the end of the season, but uh, now let's get into you. Boys <laughs> last night, Miles McBride, 46 oh. minutes. West, he's a tough as shit. Sorry if I can't spell. No, he's okay. a tough as you know. Okay, tough as shit guard from West Virginia, undersized. Sounds like Joe Missoula. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Looking right into a mirror. Joe was, yeah, Joe was a yeah. pest looking at some of his highlights. Um, but you're the guest of the hour. So we'll get we'll get into some of your things. So for Minnesota, um, you first how big of a Minnesota sports fan you were as a kid. Um, on Celtics Talk with Chris Forsberg. I watched that interview and uh Chris was somebody I met over last summer working with the the local news in Rhode Island. And uh pretty cool to go to some Celtics events. I was at Jalen Brown's like contract signing uh when they signed KP. So that was really cool to to talk with people like him, Abby Chin, another one, um, just great people overall. But again, you had that podcast with him on Celtics talk, talking about your broadcasting journey, but just talk about Minnesota in general, you know, what it was like growing up there and your passion for sports. Like when did that spark? Yeah. So when I was really young, obviously I, I was like a lot of kids who probably thought I would play in the NBA one day. Like if you, you know, they always ask you, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And for me, it was always a basketball player. I'm sure at time, like during football season, it was a professional football player. But hoops was always my favorite sport growing up, which was weird because, you know, being from Minnesota, like that's a state of hockey. Most kids say hockey's their favorite sport and they play hockey and play pond hockey, which is like easy because every body of water is frozen for like eight months of the year. Um, so it's hockey and skiing. That's what kids do in Minnesota. But for me, and I guess this was sort of foreshadowing what I would ultimately end up doing, I realize now I love football, basketball, and baseball because that's what they talked about on SportsCenter. And I would always watch SportsCenter as a kid. And I don't know if you did, Ken. Did you ever watch SportsCenter growing up? A little bit, like here and there. Like middle school is when I got like locked in with it. But here and there as a kid, yeah. So I feel like my generation, and I'm way older than you are, so maybe this checks out. My generation is the last one where SportsCenter like 
was really a cultural touchstone, you know, like you actually didn't know what happened in the games the night before when you were watching the highlights in the morning. Um, and I still watch it today. Um, and I've actually gotten a chance to anchor it sometimes, which is cool. I still watch it because I like hearing what the anchors have to say. It is like a pretty convenient way to get, you know, your highlights and your scores and a little opinion without, you know, having to seek all that out on your own. But if you do just want the scores, like you don't really need Sports Center anymore. So anyway, all that to say, I do feel like people in my age bracket, they're like the the last people who really relied on Sports Center for their news and their scores. So I would watch that religiously. Um, and I realize now that what they talked about is what I cared about. Um, and when I when I realized that was I worked in Alabama for two years out of school. I covered local news in Birmingham, Talladega Super Speedways in our market. So we covered a lot of NASCAR. And I was like, the only thing I know about NASCAR is that Jimmy Johnson won seven Cup Series championships. And why do I know that? Because that's the only time they ever talked about it on SportsCenter is when Jimmy Johnson won another one. So I realized that like they sort of dictated what I cared about. Um, and so it, that kind of makes it cool full circle that I've, I've gotten the chance to host it a couple of times. But anyway, growing up in Minnesota, I still loved hoops and that was my favorite sport. And then, you know, like everyone who decides they want to do broadcasting, when I realized I was tapped out as an athlete, which was about eighth grade, because I went from the B1 travel team to B2. I was like, all right, maybe I won't play in the NBA. <laughs> Then I decided I wanted to do something um, just to stay around sports. I took a journalism class in high school. Um, and that's kind of when I realized I could get paid to talk about sports. Like, let's try that. Um, but yeah, I grew up a big Wolves, Vikings, Twins, Wild fan. Uh, Minnesota Swarm, too. That was an indoor lacrosse team that moved to Atlanta. Heartbreaking. Um, but the thing is, growing up in Minnesota, all my teams sucked a lot. Like, People know about the Timberwolves. I barely remember when Kevin Garnett was there. Um, certainly barely remember 2004, which was, you know, until a couple of years ago, the last time they made the playoffs, they made uh, the Western Conference Finals. Um, the Vikings have had a couple really good seasons where I, I really thought they were going to win the Super Bowl. But aside from that, like the Twins would win the division, you know, pretty regularly, but never had a chance. Always got swept by the Yankees. Are you a Yankees fan too? Yeah, when I watch baseball, not not as much, but. Unfortunately, well, that sucks. So strike two for you. Um, but, you know, my teams like never really were in the hunt. And I think that kind of uh, it kind of numbed me to really rooting for specific teams. And I sort of became more of a sports fan in general. Hmm. Um, and I, I would like players and you know, I play fantasy and um, I sort of became a fan of, of the leagues as opposed to the team specifically. Um which I think has helped in in my career and also, you know, opened up this amazing new thing where I now I have a new NBA team um, and I, I'm in love with them. And like the, the first year I'm covering them is, you know, one of the best regular seasons in Celtics history. So that's nice. And I hope they win it all. But that, that, it, there sort of was a void there. Like I want to be a diehard for someone. And so now the Celtics count. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And obviously, like my dream at the end of the day too to be with a team, find a home with a team. Uh, you talk about Minnesota. That's obviously where you're from. I, there was an opening with the Lynx, the WNBA team. Yeah. And, so, um, you know, fingers crossed. I, I applied. I haven't heard anything back yet, but um, something like that, like to get my foot in the door or whatever it is, I'm trying to find opportunities like that. Um, and I want to obviously dig deep into your journey and like seek out how you got those opportunities. But for when you were like little or even like more recently too, before landing like big gigs, um, you talk about how the passion started, like who were broadcasting idols you looked up to um, to kind of like shape the way you speak and the way that you hold yourself as a broadcaster. Yeah, there are a bunch. I mean, a lot of guys from Syracuse for sure, but that's kind of recency bias because I sort of met them when I was in school. Um, I think about growing up. I mean, Keith Jackson, Brent Musburger, like, dude, you were probably just, you know, a a twinkle in your parents' eye when those guys were at their I'm meeting. only like four years younger than you. I'm not that I'm not that younger. Okay. Uh <laughs> so you remember those dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Keith Jackson, man. I, I do remember the 2005 national championship like it was yesterday. Texas USC. I mean, what a freaking game. Because hmm. I was always like the cynical sports fan in my friend group. And and the rest of them were like, oh, because everyone's rooting for Texas in that game. So 
my friends were all like, they're going to do it, man. They're going to do it. I'm like, I wish, but USC is too good. And I remember talking about that game and then watching it. And Keith Jackson is iconic. And he was, he's going for the corner. He's got it. It's like, it doesn't, Keith Jackson is a great example of, of being understated in commentary. And, and so is the guy I'm trying to follow, Mike Gorman. Like those two dudes are, are bastions of how to do the job without doing too much, which is probably something I, can do a better job of like sort of letting it come to you and playing out a little bit more, but Keith Jackson, definitely Brent Musburger. You are looking live. I think is is such a cool iconic line. A lot of people have like their go-to calls to have a go-to intro. That's pretty badass. And so Brent Musburger is, is such an OG. Uh, but then the guys who I've, I feel like I've learned the most from are um, Syracuse alumni and, and our alumni network is great. People call it a mafia. I'm not going to dispute that. Um, Jason Benetti was like the guy who really convinced me to try play by play in the first place. He was with the White Sox for a long time. Now he's with the Tigers. I used to be at ESPN. Now he's with Fox. And he, to me, I mean, he's as good as it gets. And he's really smart, super witty, has a great voice, uh, very funny. And I've learned a lot from him. Same thing for, with Ian Eagle, who, you know, whose son was my roommate in college. Noah is one of my best friends. Um, so that's been cool to get to know both of them. I've learned a lot from both of them. Um, but there are a bunch of Syracuse guys now who I feel like I've, I've gotten to take some pages out of their book. And then also this year, like learning from Mike Gorman, that's pretty freaking cool. So there are a lot of guys. Yeah. We'll get into those moments and, uh, you know, the people you've been able to look up to and, uh, kind of, again, model like your, your broadcasting skills and stuff like that around. And again, you talk about Syracuse, obviously you wear that strong on your sleeve and, um, the, the amount of programs, I mean, obviously Syracuse is one of the greatest schools in the country for sports media, but um, I know you mentioned too on a lot of podcasts that you weren't so like sold yet on broadcasting. Like you didn't know yet what you wanted to do in sports media. Like when did that like light click in your head where you wanted to, you know, be behind the camera, be the voice of whatever it is that you did? Yeah. I, when I went there, I wanted to be a writer. Um, and a big reason why is like, like I mentioned, I took a journalism class in high school and I, I thought that, writing was for me. I still love to write. And I, I think it's really important for anyone who's doing anything in journalism, frankly, or broadcasting is, is being able to write. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do when I got there. And I, I wrote a long LinkedIn message to the sports editor of the Daily Orange. And I, I treated him like he was Bob Woodward, when in reality, he was like a senior at Syracuse, who's probably getting drunk at Fagan's every Wednesday. Um, but I that's how how badly I wanted it. And also how dumb I was. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but I wanted to write for the Daily Orange, which in hindsight makes me want to throw up because now I hate the Daily Orange. We play them in the the media cup every year. It's one of the radio stations against uh, against the student newspaper. And I actually still have to this day. I still wear this. We make shirts every year because this is how nerdy we are. We make custom jerseys and we all give each other nicknames. And mine was Atwood, which is kind of a long story. But um I decided I wanted to do radio when I, I, I went to a, I met a, the sports director randomly outside a professor's office, this guy, Jay Alter, who I now work with at ESPN. He was a senior when I was a freshman. I met him randomly. He's like, Hey, come to our general interest meeting. Went to the meeting, basically met a couple of people who had become my best friends and gave it a shot and just fell in love with it. Um, and so once I got into the radio, I, that I like tried to branch into the TV too. And I, I do think it's a good lesson for anyone trying to get into this. I actually feel like, first of all, like I said, writing is important. And I think most people should start in radio, uh, in broadcasting, because you sort of learn how to, you learn how to perform with your voice. And then ultimately, you know, you start to sound off the air, like you, you want to sound on the air. Um, so it just kind of becomes your your normal speaking voice and you learn a lot about performance and also writing when you're doing radio i feel like there's there's a decent amount of writing depending on what you're doing of course but if you start in radio i feel like you can worry about a lot of stuff like how with how you sound before you have to worry about how you look and what you're doing with your hands and am i wearing mm -hmm. the right makeup you know what i mean so i feel like it was good to start in radio uh, but anyway all that to say like i i sort of got a taste of it in college and then and then that became what i pursued pretty hard Talk about your first time ever behind the mic. Oh, was, I mean, disgusting. Like, <laughs> I'm surprised that they didn't kick me out of the station. I actually still have a clip of it. Somehow, 
so it used to be iTunes and I had a, a bunch of my stuff saved in iTunes. Then when it became Apple music, it converted all of it. So now half of my Apple music library is old clips from when I was a student and had no idea what I was doing. Not that I really know now, but especially back then. And so if I'm like in the car with somebody and I shuffle all my songs, there's a good chance you'll hear <laughs> 18 year old drew who's never done anything broadcasting before. Um, but yeah, it, it was bad. I mean, it was really bad. And I think those four years, like, I, I feel like I'm almost unrecognizable from when I was a freshman to when I was a senior. And and the way I did that is just by doing it, right? Like you just, the more you do something, the better you get. It's like almost anything in life. Um, and I think you just find your voice and and that's sort of what happened to me. And people, like people always ask me about the process at Syracuse because it does pump out so many broadcasters and I, I to me the great thing about Syracuse is it gives you every chance to find your own voice and I know like I think there's an idea out there that you know everyone from Syracuse is the same and there's a lot of homogeneity it's like a conveyor belt I, I really rebel against that it can be um, if you don't try to find your own voice but to me the great thing about it is you get a ton of opportunities on the air um, and you get great feedback and feedback from people you respect and and want to be like. And our alumni network is awesome for that. So I think if you use if you use that platform to find your own voice as opposed to trying to sound like everybody else, it can be really good for you. And so that's why I feel lucky to have gone there. Yeah. And you also talked with uh, Chris Forsberg on the Celtics talk about like finding your voice and um, how your dad was also a big influence in that as well. And again, the people that you talked about with, uh, you know, the um, broadcasters you looked up to growing up yeah. and things like that but uh, you also mentioned too that one of your first jobs was with um cbs 42 in birmingham alabama um post-grad i, I want to know too like that transition like you you obviously had play by play in the back of your head but yeah. you're taking these anchoring jobs these reporting jobs how do you transition from jobs like that like what is that application process like and in, in, in stuff like that what goes into all of that yeah it's a great question cam because I, I agonized over that decision, whether to take that job. So when I was, when I graduated, I was like, I'm just going to take the summer. I'm going to go home to Minnesota. I'm going to hang with my family. I'm going to hang with our Corgi and not worry about the job hunt until the fall, which I don't know how smart that was because I, I do want to do play by play. It's always been the thing I wanted to do out of school. And the timing of that is kind of tough because minor league baseball tends to start in April and, and I graduated in May. So the timing wasn't great, but I was like, I just want to go home for the summer because every summer in college, I had been doing college baseball in the summer um, in Syracuse after my freshman year on the Cape after my sophomore year. And then in Auburn, New York, which is a little bit west of Syracuse and minor league ball um, after my junior year. So I was like, I haven't really had a chance to spend a summer at home in a while. I'm, I'm going to do that. Plus, I went to college far away from home. So I'm like, let's just chill in Minnesota for a little bit. Got an email from the news director in Birmingham and I'd gotten a few of those um because people had like seen my reel on YouTube or whatever or found me on social media and you know I, I always declined because I didn't want to do local news mm. um and so I was getting ready to write the same email to this guy Rob uh, but I you know I read it a little bit more and it was like we're a top 50 market we cover Alabama and Auburn um in a time when sports departments are shrinking we're growing so, you know, this actually sounds pretty interesting. So I hit him back and we started talking. I went down there for a tour and I really liked everybody and it seemed great. Uh, but the, the thing is, I just I wanted to call games. Mm. Uh, and so I talked to, I remember talking with Jason Benetti, who I mentioned earlier, who's like my my mentor. And he, he said, I think if you want to call games, you should do that. You should call games. And I'm like, yeah, but this seems like a really good opportunity. He's like, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but like you should do what you want to do. Um so that was probably the one time where I have ignored Benetti's advice and I decided to take the job anyway. But the good thing is, you know, I got really lucky with an awesome boss, really multiple awesome bosses. Chris Brees was our sports director and he was cool with me doing some freelance stuff so I could call the games. In addition to my day job, I got some opportunities with Big Ten Network, called a few sports for them. Then COVID hit and then no one was hiring freelancers. But thankfully, I had some tape from the first six months in Birmingham which I could use once I um, auditioned with ESPN. Um, but yeah, you know, the thing, I think the bigger lesson there though is, first of all, you know, to get to where you want to go, you're always going to be a more attractive candidate 
if you're doing something as opposed to just sitting around and waiting, right? Like I think to hire me to do play-by-play, -play, ESPN would have rather had me anchoring and reporting in local news than just like sitting on my ass. You know, it's always better to be doing something than nothing. And the other thing is I really believe that everything and what we do, Cam, everything in broadcasting helps the other stuff. I mentioned writing earlier. I think writing makes you a better reporter. I think reporting makes you a better anchor. I think anchoring makes you a better analyst, makes you a better play-by-play -play announcer, makes you a better whatever. Um, I really think all that stuff goes hand in hand because ultimately what you realize is you're telling stories and you're trying to entertain and inform the viewer and sometimes maybe make them feel something depending on what you're talking about. So I think they all go hand in hand. And that I, I really that affirm my belief in that when I was doing the anchoring and reporting, I feel like it made me a better announcer. Yeah. And with tackling, you know, doing play by play for the big 10 um, again, also with uh, you know, the, the job you had with CBS 42 in Alabama, you know, shortly after that, your first big break with ESPN, like you talked about um, how do you go about making these connections and reaching out to people in order to get your name, you know, on these people's radars for these major opportunities, like, you know, the one you, you, the one you've received now with the Celtics. And of course, like, you know, in the past too. Well, I'm super lucky. I have a, and that's kind of the common thread of my career is I feel like wicked lucky at all times, even going back to when I got into Syracuse. Um, but because of Syracuse, I have known this guy, Kevin Belby for a long time and Belby's my agent. And so we started working together right after college. It was kind of funny. You know, I, I had met him probably a junior year. We sort of became friends my senior year. And I was like, Hey man, like, I'd love to, I'd love for you to represent me right after graduation. And he basically, he basically in a nice way told me to like pump the brakes, kid. Like we're not going to represent you right out of school. But then, you know, again, I got really lucky. I won this award as a, as a student broadcaster. And then he kind of came back and was like, you know what, maybe we could, <laughs> we could work together. And I'm like, all right, man, that's great. Mm. Um, and so we've been working together ever since graduation, which is almost five years now. And that's wild. And he's, he's very connected and he's, he set up that ESPN audition, um, which was actually a studio audition. Cause like I said, I had done some play by play for a big 10 network. So they sort of had my tape from there when I mean, they knew that was my main thing. I think they brought me in to the studio in Charlotte to do like an SEC network run through show because they wanted to see if I could operate in that environment without basically shitting all over myself. Like I was sitting next to Roman Harper, legendary Alabama safety who played in the NFL for a long time. And I was trying to go from market 45 to ESPN. And so could I handle that? And luckily the audition went super well. Roman was great. The guy who produced it was great. And I think they looked at me as someone who could potentially fill multiple roles for them, like a utility guy, like do the play-by-play -play is my main thing. But I was like, hey, guys, I'm going to move to Connecticut, whether you want me to or not. And I'd love to get some reps in the studio. Um, and I think, like, let's just be honest. I'm a pretty unremarkable dude, like on the surface, like I'm a white guy who wants to talk about sports. There are a lot of us. Right. And so I think for, for ESPN, uh, the fact that I could do multiple things for them was where I could maybe provide value. Um, and so I think that's another big lesson is like the more things you can do, obviously the more attractive you're going to be as a potential hire. So post-grad, you know, graduation, you go back home, you get the job in Alabama uh, we talked about the connections that you were made, the, the agent that you had, and um, the people that helped you get that first job right out of school. Um, as far as, again, like reaching out, like as far as like applications go and things like that, what's your process? What was your process like after school? Like what was your mindset like at that time? I mean, like I said, like I, I didn't really, I wasn't really pursuing anything, you know, off the rip. I, I kind of wanted to just, chill for a little bit um yeah. uh, but i i got i got really lucky because you know someone found me um uh, but i i do think it's it's important to you know put your best foot forward like online obviously i mean nowadays like it, i feel like it's just so different from how it used to be i don't know 20 years ago 20 years ago you probably it might be too recent let's say 30 30 years ago you probably write a letter like a cover letter would be an actual letter <laughs> you might handwrite or pop that bad boy out of a printer and and mail it with a, a tape like a physical tape not a reel you put on youtube 
and you probably have to apply that way. It's just not like that anymore, which is nice. Um, and I mean, that's also, it goes hand in hand with how the industry has changed. Like you can make a living on social media and YouTube now, which is just way different. And I think um, I sort of, I tried to embrace that with, that's one of the reasons I really wasn't sweating it when I left college. Um, I mean, easy to say in hindsight, I probably was a little bit stressed and I think it's, it's a normal feeling, but for me, I was thinking like, it's going to work out. I'm, I'm going to get a good job and, you know, I'm lucky to be able to go home and, and stay with my family for a little bit. Um, but I also think it's not as linear as it used to be. Like at least this was kind of how I looked at it at, Syrac at Syracuse is like, well, if you want to be an anchor or a reporter or a host, you're going to go on local news. And then if you want to do play by play, you're going to go minor league baseball. And like, there are two paths. And I think what's great about the industry now is it's just not that simple. Um, you can do, you can do like gambling online. You can make TikToks, you know, you can do local news and call games. Like people have sort of broken the mold. Um, so I think that was the nice thing is like, you don't have to, you don't have to give up one to do the other. Um, but I mean, ultimately Cam, like I'm probably a bad person to ask that question. Cause I just got super lucky really at, at every step of the way. Yeah. I mean, the work attests to it too. Like just looking at like the things that you had put out before landing your first job, it's like, I'm trying to emulate that. And um, someone I'm sure, you know, too, Carlo Jimenez who won the award, the Jim Nance award last yeah. year. Like you know, that. he's been popping off on social media and he kind of inspired me too to make those like uh, like those split screen reels uh, yeah. on Instagram. And I was able to partner up with Barstool and um, do it with my school. So Barstool Roadie yeah. is uh, the Barstool account for the University of Rhode Island. And um, they were like, oh, we see you posting these games. This is that. Can you make like little clips of like I, and I knew the kid that that ran the account. I'm like, yeah, I can I can do that. Like similar to the podcast. And um, I split the screens up and I was like. I off the jump, I said it was from from Carlo and, um, you know, that the, the account, we, the numbers were going up and I'm like, I'm going to do this every every week, every time I call a game. And, yeah. Um, I feel like that's been like part of like the success I've been able to have as a broadcaster and the opportunities I've had just by like social media. Um, at the time, was it kind of similar in that sense or was it more more so like sending out emails like, I, like we mentioned and things like that? Yeah, it was really, I mean, I put a lot of, a lot of time into the reel I put on yeah. YouTube. Um, and it's funny, man, like if, if I never won that award, I don't know what it would look like. Like, I don't know if I would have started working with Kevin. I don't know if, if I would have, you know, gotten the audition with ESPN or if I would have even gotten the first job. But for me, it was, it was putting the effort in on the reel on YouTube, which is kind of, again, how, why I feel a little talking to you. Like you're talking about TikTok and Instagram. I'm like, YouTube was the social media of my day, which yeah. obviously is, like we had all that stuff. But to me, I didn't, I didn't really post that much on like Twitter or Instagram. And I think um, the one thing about Syracuse that I, I don't really like looking back on it is there are so many people there who want to do it. And it, it does feel competitive, even when it's a healthy competition, which I feel like we had in my grade. And Noah was a big reason why for that because he was just so mature kind of leading everybody. But I do feel like everybody feels like they need to be perfect, at least on social media. Um, and it it sort of like deters us from really posting anything. I mean, that was how I felt. I think a couple of my buddies in, in my grade felt the same way. Um, it was like we didn't have a chance to be dipshit kids on Twitter and like fire off some takes, which maybe is a good thing. <laughs> so yeah right <laughs> should be anything bad in our history but i do kind of lament that um and i think it's great what you're doing like that's smart that's the best thing you can do like not only are you you using the opportunities to call games to improve at that but you're also using it to market yourself that's really smart yeah i'm tr and trying to do it in any kind of aspect on social media like youtube i'll put like longer clips up there instagram's like a little short clips things like that but um you know my website try to incorporate everything in it so every it's that much easier for people to view um which has been like the yeah. probably like the top uh of all the advice that i've been able to get like have a website portfolio have all that stuff out there but um yeah you know for you again you never like, know who's gonna find it right yeah, there's no exactly downside. for sure and like we talk about the espn opportunity you had you know really put you on the map as far as like you know like your biggest like one of like the biggest breaks you had throughout your career and again the toy story game you talk about a lot in the podcast that you've been on um 
back in October, back in London for the Falcons and the Jaguars. And I'm sure a ton of other games in college and stuff like that throughout all sports. But um, we talk about like the highlights. How about like the lows? Like what's a game that you can remember that, you know, wasn't your best game, but helped you like fight through a tough time and, and stuff like that throughout mm-hmm. your career? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, recently, we had a game uh, at Kansas, Allen Fieldhouse, which, you know, if you talk to if you talk to real ball knowers in college hoops, they'll tell you that Allen Fieldhouse is like consensus, the best place to watch a game. It's it's sick and it lives up to the hype. They played BYU, actually lost. It was the first time they'd lost at the fog in over a year. Um, they And they were also leading at halftime. They had won like 71 straight at home when leading at halftime. So BYU went in there and basically shocked the world. Um, And because I'm following more so NBA this year, I haven't been able to watch a ton of college hoops. So I know I'm filling out my bracket right now with my heart over my head. So I have BYU in the final four. Cause like when I saw them, they beat Kansas at the fog, which was sick. I do think they're going to do well in the tournament. Um, And so that was an awesome game to call, but we had like major technical difficulties the entire game our audio was cutting out randomly. And I would say, you know, a third of the game, you couldn't even hear us and you couldn't hear the natural sound either. And I, like, we were pretty pissed. Um, I try not to get mad in those situations. Cause I know the people behind the scenes are, are trying to fix it. It's not like they're like throwing their hands up like, Oh, well, fuck it. It doesn't matter. Mm. So it, I would get mad if that were the case, but I knew people were trying to fix it. Um, so it's not worth getting angry, but we were frustrated because that was a great game and a great place that just deserved better. Um, And it was also hard to call the game. I'm I'm with Debbie Antonelli, who just went into the hall of fame for broadcasting. She's a legend. And um, we can't even hear each other for some of the time. Cause when the audio goes out, it goes out in our headsets too. It's like, every time I open my mouth to say something, I'm not sure if it's going to go on the air that like that sucked. Hmm. Um, So that was really frustrating. And I wasn't sure how well we did based on that. So I was, I was I was frustrated with that, but I think it goes back to controlling what you can control. And also, I would say having the emotional intelligence, which I'm not saying, you know, I'm I'm the best at, but I just don't really respect when people freak out over technical difficulties and like yell at, you know, producers and APs and, and audio guys, et cetera, because first of all, they're working harder than we are they're the people who are more important than we are. Cause if you can't see the game and, or hear the game, then nobody cares what we have to say. Um, and also, you know, I, I find that going ape shit about stuff like that is actually counterproductive. Um, and so if you can, you know, c- control your frustration and be patient and ask what you can do to help, that's the best way to handle it. There have been a couple of times during the Celtic season where I've, I've been pretty discouraged, you know, um, Mike Gorman following him is is hard like it's a lot of pressure and I know how people feel about Mike he's been here for 43 years and he's earned his flowers and I'm I'm really glad he's getting them and he's been awesome to me um and I I know that you know people are going to be uncomfortable with the change cuz there's a comfort level with Mike for a lot of fans like they've never known another Celtics announcer so I I I came in understanding that not everybody would like co-sign me being the new Celtics announcer uh, but there are still times where it's like, man, I, you see like a tweet or something or, you know, some hack from from Barstool, like saying that I suck or whatever. And that's just tough, you know, like it's a natural human emotion to want to be liked. And then, you know, there's a chance that that can make you kind of question what you're doing. Like, am I the guy for this? Have some imposter syndrome. And do I need to change the way I'm doing the job? And ultimately, I, I find that you can't you can't worry about that. Um, what we do, Cam, especially like in this situation, you know, calling games for a team that's had legendary announcers and being the new guy, I find that it's it's a little bit like being in politics. Like you can't make everybody happy. Some people will say you talk too much. Some say you don't talk enough. Some people will say, I think you guys are hilarious. Some people will say, can you shut the fuck up and just talk about the game? Like it, it's just, it's really hard to to please everybody. Um, and I find I find that ultimately the people whose opinions I really value are the people who I would ask for advice anyway. Um, So my boss, our producer, our director, Scal, Abby, uh, my mentors, you know, I I, I try not to take criticism from 
people who I, I wouldn't take advice from. And then the last thing is um, the first game I ever called at ESPN was an ACC network college football game at Wake Forest. And there was a, there was a kickoff return for a touchdown that I totally botched because I was looking down at my board and I was trying to find a note about like the kickoff specialist or something. And I missed the fact that the guy was running down the sideline for a touchdown. I think it was just Taylor who ended up playing in the NFL. And I was just so angry and I, I blew the call and I learned two things because I, I was so mad. I like spiked my pen in the booth and like basically made an ass out of myself. It's like, first of all, if you mess something up, like let's go get them next time. That's a three and a half hour broadcast. Like there are plenty of chances um to fix that and then the other thing was if you're looking down for even a split second you can miss something so the more you can the more you can remember what you write down in your notes and have it ready to go without having to look down at it the better you can look down at that stuff during a break or a timeout but when the ball is live like you got to be watching it which sounds like the most basic advice ever but um I messed up in that moment and I've I've remembered that you know, two and a half years later, and especially in the NBA where stuff moves fast and, you know, some like every night you'll see something you've never seen before. These guys are freak shows. Um, it's important to be watching the game you're calling at all times. Yeah. And throughout all that adversity too, like, I mean, you're in this spot for a reason that you're in right now with the Celtics. And um, again, we talked about like those games that, that didn't go your way or, or weren't, you know, traditional to the way that you're used to broadcasting, but it led you to this point with the Celtics, all that stuff and all that, yeah. Um, adversity throughout your journey is run me through that process of of getting that gig with the Celtics. You know what I mean? Like that that build up to that anticipation, everything that went into that day and that whatever how long process it was. It's crazy, Cam. It's like I might have said this on Forsberg's pod, but it's like I would compare that process to like a three hour movie where nothing really happens in the first two hours and forty five minutes, and then the last fifteen are just crazy, and like everything comes to a head at once. Hmm. I started talking with the people from NBC Sports Boston, I think in February, um, and, and didn't get the job until October or maybe late September. So it was a long process. You know, I completely understand it. It was a big decision they were making with who's going to follow a legend. Um, and throughout the entire process, I never thought I was going to get the job. I was basically just like, I'm just going to put my best foot forward here and we'll let the chips fall. You know, um, I had an interview with, my now boss, Kevin Miller, who's a VP at NBC Sports Boston and the producer of the Celtics broadcast, Paul Lucy. We talked. I thought it went well. Um, still didn't think I was going to get it. Then did the audition with Scal. Thought it went great. Had a blast with him. Still didn't think I was going to get it. Um, stayed in touch with those guys throughout the summer. Still didn't think I was going to get it. Then I had an interview with uh, Rich Gotham, the, the president of the Celtics, who went to PC. So he's got some Rhode Island connections. And Thought that went great. And at that point, I was like, you know, maybe this guy's pretty busy. I don't think he's meeting with that many people for the announcer job, but still wasn't like confident by any means. But I was grateful for the opportunity to talk with those guys. And then eventually they offered me the job. And it was, I mean, total whirlwind. My parents live on Cape Cod year round now. Uh, they lived in Minnesota for 23 years, but my sister lives in New York. And when they moved, I was living in Connecticut. So they wanted to be a little bit closer. And we all love the Cape. So they moved there like a year before I even started talking to the Celtics. And so I actually didn't tell them um, I got the job until I could see them in person. And it was after we took photos at media day. So I went down there and told them and showed them some photos with Scal. And that was a pretty sweet moment, especially, you know, cause like your parents are obviously so instrumental in your journey, no matter what. But for me, it's like, they, they let me go to college, you know, basically on the other side of the country and never asked any questions when I was like, I'm going to stay in Syracuse for the summer and call minor league baseball with mostly D three guys. Some of them were from Salve Regina actually in a, uh, in Newport, mm -hmm. Rhode Island. But uh, just like to be able to share that with them was, was pretty neat. And obviously it all worked out great because I'm close to them and I love living in Boston and can still go to Bristol and do the studio stuff. So again, really, really lucky. And I heard you talk about on Chris's podcast as well. Um, you know, talking about your first preseason game, the first time like behind the mic with the Celtics, uh, again the iconic preseason peak uh, calls and the pitching hour and all that, yeah, um, kind of sparked that social media like attraction to your name and things like that. And 
Um, you say you owe a lot of credit to Peyton Pritchard for making those calls, but yeah. besides the few games themselves, what was that anticipation leading up to that first game? Oh, my God. I was shitting my pants, dude. <laughs> and the first game, you'll appreciate this as a Knicks fan, the first game I called was at MSG. So it's like wow. not only am I starting this insane job and super nervous about how people are going to respond to me, You're in the not, because, not necessarily because I, I care – about you know what people think of me but more so because I want them to enjoy the the broadcast of their favorite team and I know that they've been treated to like one of the best to ever do it for the last four plus decades so I don't want to diminish that at all but also like oh my god I'm at Madison Square Garden and I feel like I did a pretty bad job of um, living in the moment and soaking up the fact that the first NBA game I called was at the world's most famous arena because I was I was kind of like I was just nervous about the show. Like I was in my own head a little bit and I'm like looking over my notes again and, you know, meeting a lot of people. And I think, I think what I'm trying to do now is, is sort of look around and pause and smell the roses a little bit. Um, But that, that was crazy doing that first game. But the thing is like, Scal has been so cool to me. I mean, from the jump, like the first time we ever met was probably two minutes before we started doing the audition together. Um, we did the the Sixers game six of the round two series. We did that live when they were in Philly. Um, and at that moment, like, I was nervous going into it. But as soon as I started chopping it up with Scal, like, those nerves kind of went away. Um, and that has sort of – that sort of carried into into the job. Like, that guy's been my biggest champion from from the moment we met. And he's he's really helped me, like, settle down and settle in. So – I, I give him a lot of credit for that, and I definitely owe him for that. Yeah, and I, mean, I haven't experienced, obviously, anything like that in my career yet, but um, trying to manifest it and, and thinking of, like, trying to, like, relate to that situation is, like, living in the moment you talk about a lot is, like, not worrying so much about your notes, but, like, embracing the moment that you're in uh, at that moment. Yeah. For someone like me, you know, for the past three years in college, trying to, you know, I guess, perfect a spot chart and realize like what works for me and things like that. What does Drew yep. Carter's spot chart look like during a game? I can send it to you if you want. I mean, I have a, a template for every sport. I use a spreadsheet um, on Excel and I use still use the same template I've used since college. And mm. I don't know if I'll ever change because, you know, old habits die hard. But I'm sure there are a bunch of Syracuse guys from the same time I went to college who are using these boards all over the place. But basically... Um, I'm up. So I'm like a, I'm a sweat the small stuff guy. Like I love minutia and detail. So every time I put a, a throwback logo up in the corners and with the Celtics, I actually will send this to you. I have this great throwback logo. I think it's their first one in team history with the, the leprechaun who looks almost like mischievous and devious. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, his knees are bent, so it sort of looks like he's sitting. So I kind of have him sitting on one of the lines in the spreadsheet. I think it looks pretty cool. I'm never going to change that. But then I have, like, and, and you probably know what I'm talking about here, like the names and the numbers and the heights and the weights and the hometowns, the age, where they went to school, where they're from, like the nuts and bolts. And then I have the stats in there as well. I keep track of points on my own because I also have their season high and career high um, kind of marked out in bold and in a different color. So I know if they're approaching it. Um, and then I have team stats too. And I mean, we're all the same in this sense. We're always tinkering. So I like during this season, I added a little row or two rows for coaches challenges. Um, so I, and I have the the record and I think Missoula's 31 and 31 and 14 at this point, which has got to be one of the best in the NBA, hmm. but I have that row so I can write down like what the call was when it happened and, and the results. So I know, Hey, if they have an extra challenge, later in the game but yeah it's all about like i know some people handwrite everything um because it helps them remember i do handwrite a lot of stuff on the board but i also type the things that uh to me are like the skeleton of the board um but you're always you're always changing it based on what works for you yeah definitely i've been experimenting with a bunch of boards like throughout the three years that i've been broadcasting and um i feel like i found one that like works for me i definitely would love to see the one that you've got that'd be awesome and yeah. um you know, we go back to like talking about Scal and, and filling in the role for Mike Gorman uh, come next year. You'll be on home and away games, but uh, the whole NB NBC sports team in general, um, you know, how much have they influenced you already in this short amount of time that you've been with them and um, specifically Mike and, and Scal in, in specific? 
Well, I mean, like I said, everybody's been extremely supportive and extremely yeah. cool. Um, Mike easily could have been unsure of me. And maybe he is, but he's done a good job of hiding it. But he could have been like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, mm. I've been doing this almost twice as long as he's been alive. Like, why would they hire him? Um, but I haven't I haven't gotten that from him at all. I, he actually told me that he's kind of happy that they hired someone he didn't know because it gives us a chance to, you know, develop this new friendship and it's, it's organic now. And um, I've just, I've really enjoyed getting to know him and it's cool for me, Cam, cause like I'm not from Boston. So I didn't really grow up with the Mike and Tommy show, like people around here did. So it, it's been neat for me to kind of understand the experience and why people are, why people feel so strongly about those guys. Um, and I, I kind of get it now that I've met Mike and hung out with him. I, to me, what what's most impressive about Mike is, is not even the stuff he does on the air. It's what he does off the air and just how good of a guy he is and how easy it is to hang out with him. Like he's just, he's ultra cool, man. He's, he's Mike. He makes it look effortless. So that's been really neat. Um, and it, again, it's sort of taken some of the edge off with, like putting pressure on myself. So it's Mike and Scal and Abby, Paul and Jim, our producer and director, Mina and Eddie and Forsberg and Giles and Mannix in the studio. Like it really has felt like a, like a team environment. Um, it helps that the actual team, the Celtics are so good. Everybody's just in a better mood, but yeah, those people have been awesome to me. Yeah. And I heard on a Syracuse podcast too, that in 2019, before you graduated, you were able to attend uh, the Super Bowl, the Rams versus the Patriots, and you yeah. mentioned like, you know, you never you, you never know who you're going to run into on Radio Row in Vegas, right? And um, obviously somebody like Mike won't be there, but like people of his caliber are there. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. hang on, no one is of his caliber, right? He's, exactly. He's one of one. <laughs> legendary, legendary broadcasters, yeah. legendary, you know, radio hosts and things like that. Any kind of interaction, like meeting people on Radio Row, similar to the first time that you met Mike. Yeah, Kevin Harlan came on. That was pretty neat. We did a, a show every day um, for one of our student radio stations, and, and Kevin Harlan came on, and that was pretty special. He, What I remember about that is, first of all, he sounds exactly the same in yeah. person as he does on the air, which I was like, I can't believe that. I Still, to this day, I can't believe that because it sounds like he's – I mean, he's. it sounds like he's doing opera. Like, yeah. that's <laughs> how amazing his voice is, but he's – He's a salt of the earth guy too. He was so cool with us. He also, when he was wearing the headset, he was holding his left ear the entire time. And if you ever watch him, like during the run of play, if you can see the broadcast table, that, right? a lot of the time he'll yeah. be doing that. And I, I don't know why I've never asked him about it, but I've gotten a chance to, to see him a couple times after that. Actually pretty recently in Boston, we went out to dinner with a couple other people from, you know, ESPN radio and TNT. And that was pretty insane. Um, Kind of, again, like kind of a pinch me moment. There have been a lot of those this year. But to talk to him when I was a student was was really, really neat. And then Scott Hansen, too, the guy from Red Zone. Mm -hmm. He's a Syracuse guy. He was actually the long snapper on the football team. Um, and he's one of the most intense dudes I've ever met. Like he and Joe Mazzula would probably get along really well. But they're intense in different ways. Um, like Scott Hansen makes, I would describe it as extreme eye contact feels like he's shooting lasers through your eyes, which makes sense because he looks like Clark Kent kind of, uh, but he, he is, he's an intense guy and you can, you can feel why he's the perfect fit to do seven hours of commercial free football. Although what I wish I would have asked him is why can't you just go to the bathroom once dude? Like when the, when the early slate is over, you can go to the bathroom. Maybe that's a bad time because you got to transition people to the late slate. But just tell the the control room, hey, for two minutes, just take this game full at the start of a drive. I guess, I mean, I guess they could go three and out really quickly and then he wouldn't be able to do it. But there's got to be a way, Scott. Come on. He's just doing that for theater at this point. Mm. Yeah, you talk about uh, Kevin Harlan. I was able to meet. So for when I worked at the Sports Hub in my sophomore year summer going into junior year, um, I emailed Sean Grandy, who you obviously know, the voice of the Celtics on the radio, and I had him on the podcast. We talked a little bit, developed a little bit of a relationship, and I met him at that overtime game I talked about when I that we saw the Knicks, and Kevin Harlan was there. He was calling the game with with Reggie, and 
um, just to be able to shake his hand and talk to him for like that quick 20 seconds. I have a video. I'm like looking up at him, like so starstruck, just yeah. shaking his hand and then obviously talking to Sean and um, like those kinds of moments are like super surreal. And I was able to meet Mike Breen too at a Knicks game before. Oh. And, you know, it makes you realize like, so you know, it could be, yeah, it could be you one day. And I mean, obviously you're in that spot now, but for someone like me, um, it's truly inspiring too. And it, again, just to sit here with you is, is an honor in itself. So, um, you know, when you look at the greats and you're working closely with someone like Mike and, um, even though this is just the beginning for you, how do you feel like you can ingrain your name in Celtics history? Like Mike did. I mean, I, again, there's no one that can do it like Mike, but wow. you know, so, yeah. something like that, when you look back, how can you, how do you feel like you could do the same? Man, that's, that's pretty wild. It's I don't know. Crazy like, to think about. Yeah, I think um, I guess the answer would be to not force it. And like I said earlier, I I think I've, there have been times this year where I probably have forced it. And being the new guy, and you know, it's my first season full time covering the NBA, and I'm covering the best team in the league. So like, you see crazy stuff every night. So my my reactions are genuine on the air, but sometimes they might be a little much and. I think there are probably times where I could lay out a little bit more and take a page out of Mike's book and maybe just chill out. <laughs> but I think the more I do it, the the more I'll I'll get there. And and the ultimately the thing is, Cam, like people remember big moments because of the moment, not because of the call. Like a great call in a great moment goes a long way. Um, but you have to let the moment happen first. You can't you can't force it. Um, so I guess I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, doing it for a long time would help getting, getting people comfortable with Scal and Abby and me as a team, I think would help. Um, but what I try to do is every time we go on the air, try to teach someone something, try to put a smile on someone's face, maybe tell them a story that, that makes them feel something. I think the more we do that consistently, um, the more people will get comfortable with us and kind of know what to expect when they turn the TV on. And when people allow you into their living rooms or bedrooms or wherever they're watching the game, that's, I mean, that's a big, big deal to me. Like that, that means a lot. And I know that you can't rush a relationship. And what I want to have is a relationship with the fan base. Um, and so I think it's going to take time, but hopefully in time people will, will feel feel comfortable with us and it'll feel natural and they'll feel like they know us through the TV. And I think that's how a, a local announcer becomes like Gorman esque, I guess, but long way to go. <laughs> yeah. And this is only year one. There's, there's plenty of years down the road to again, like improve and, and see like, you know, how much everything's changed from year one to, you know, whatever point it is in time. But um yeah. In this season alone, you've already done a lot of games on the road. Um, coming up on the last few minutes here, just quick questions like your craziest moment so far behind the mic watching a game. Jalen Brown dunked on Rudy Gobert and basically deported him to France with that <laughs> poster. It was sick. And it was early in the game, and it was at Minnesota, which was cool for me to be home. Um, but that was funny because it was like two minutes in, and we were in that first TV timeout. I'm like – almost took the headset off. I'm like, well, my work here is done because I felt great about the call and that play was sick. And then it ended up being a really good game that unfortunately we lost in overtime, but that was probably the craziest one. The thing is in the NBA, excuse me, in the NBA, you see stuff like that every night. Yeah. And what's been the coolest interaction you've had with players so far? I mean, obviously working with uh, close to um, one of the greatest players in the league in, in Tatum and, um, you know, it was the, the two J's and, you know, the whole team in general, the best team in the NBA right now. Like, what has that yeah. experience been like? I know you mentioned on Chris's podcast that um, you haven't built relationships with them and there's a, a distant, like, you know, part from that. I get that. But anything in general that you think of when you hear that question? Yeah, that was, I mean, well, that was in the preseason. So luckily I've had a chance to get to know a lot of the guys. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, I'm pretty close with a couple of them. Um one that jumps out, though, sticking with Jalen and dunking on people. The first time I ever had a real conversation with him was in L.A. He was at the hotel front desk. And um, I was like, I guess it's time to introduce myself. <laughs> it had been a couple months. And like, I, I try to stay out of the way, you know, like I'm not part of the team. Even though we do travel with the team, there is a little bit of separation there. 
Uh, but I, I did want to, you know, introduce myself and be like, hey, I'm the guy who's like screaming your name on TV if you see the highlights. Um, and he was super cool. And I was like, hey, man, we need a new nickname for you. If you look at basketball reference, there's only two things on there. There's JB and old man. And he kind of smiled. He's like, yeah, that's what my mom used to call me. Um, and I was like, we need something. I, I threw a couple options at him and he like he it seemed like he got a kick out of him. And I'm like, you you pick, man, you tell me. And he's like, get back to me in the new year. So fast forward, I never really asked him until about a week ago. And I think we were in Salt Lake and I saw him in the uh, hotel elevator. And he he told me which one he liked. I haven't got, I gotten a chance to unveil it yet, but it's pretty freaking cool, man. Like this guy's an all NBA player. Like he makes $300 million on his deal. Like, and he's, I mean, Jalen Brown's not a normal guy. He's I actually think one of the most interesting dudes in the league off the court. Um, but he's super nice. And it's kind of, it's kind of refreshing to see, you know, you, you don't really know what to expect from guys that famous and that rich, but everyone on the team has been really cool with me. And I think they really enjoy being together. It's a big reason why I think we we will win the championship this year. For sure. And I'll definitely be listening out, listening out for that call uh, when yeah. the time's right. Um, but that's all the time I got for you, Drew. I appreciate you again for hopping on Camp's Corner throughout the your busy schedule and, you know, the tail end of the season here. But um, million dollar question I always ask everybody before the podcast ends is, what did you think of Camp's Corner? <laughs> this is great, man. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to see your boards now. I want to yeah. see your play-by-play -play charts. And I'm also going to be stalking your Instagram to see your side-by-side -side reels on Barstool Please, Roadie. by all means. <laughs> I'm excited to see it, but thanks for having me on, man. I mean, you're doing all the right stuff. Like I always tell people is uh, never say no to an opportunity. Do as much as you possibly can. Do sweat the small stuff. And I mean, I'm, I'm stoked to see you kind of carving your own way through the industry now, like doing the podcast and doing the social media stuff. So keep it up, bro. But let's get a Celtics jersey behind you instead of a Knicks jersey. That perfect way to segue into that. When I, like I told you, April 11th, I'll be at that Knicks game. Hopefully that you're there. I, I do yeah. want, I've met Scal a couple of occasions as a fan. Obviously, probably doesn't remember me, but this is probably one of the best jerseys I have in the collection. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if anybody owns one of these. But and so the funny thing about this is, this is uh, of all the jerseys I could have got during this year, the 75th anniversary of the NBA, it's this one. So That's I think I think this is uh I gotta hang this up somewhere. I don't know where to put it yet, but I'll That's definitely bring, I'll bring it when when I come to that game. But. Yeah, bring it, bring it. We'll get it signed for you. That's dope. It kind of is like um, someone wears a Tingus Pingus jersey yeah. to every Celtics home game, which is so funny. Like if you've ever seen that video from when the Knicks drafted him, mm. uh, but that's that's nice. Those novelty jerseys, they're always the best. Good. Bring that to the game. He'll sign it. He'll sign anything for sure. And again, Drew, again, like I said, thank you so much for hopping on. Uh, at Cam's One Corner, all social media platforms, podcast platforms, YouTube, everything like that. Go check out Drew on all his social media as well. Um, and if you're a Celtics fan, even if you're not NBC Sports Boston, you'll hear him on the away games and uh, next year, home and away, which is pretty surreal to say. And uh, I wish you the best of luck. Definitely want to keep in contact. Very happy that uh, we can make this happen and I'll see you soon. Thanks, Cam. Sounds great, buddy.